I'd just like to open by welcoming everybody to our library and saying thank you for coming out. Um, it's your enthusiasm and uh, attendance at things like this that make programs here at our little library at the end of the earth uh, possible. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank <coughs> Nan Senator of the Provincetown Bookstore for all of her efforts in getting Michael here, as well as Tim's Youth Bookstore. <laughs> Tim's used bookstore for co-sponsoring the event. So, um, someone with Michael's talent and resume could obviously be anywhere in the world tonight, but he's here <laughs> with us in Provincetown, Mass, um, and we really, really appreciate that. So, thank you, Michael. Um, like I always say when I end up up here to introduce something like this. You're definitely not here to listen to me talk. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce the Pulitzer Prize winner and the author of the new novel, The Snow Queen. Let's welcome Mr. Michael Cunningham. <laughs> Celestial light appeared to Barrett Meeks in the sky over Central Park four days after Barrett had been mauled once again by love. It was by no means his first romantic drop kick, but it was the first to have been delivered <clears throat> by way of a five line text, the fifth of which was a crushingly corporate wish for good luck in the future, followed by three lowercase x's. <laughs> During the past four days, Barrett had been doing his best to remain undiscouraged by what seemed lately to be a series of progressively terse and tepid breakups. In his 20s, love had usually ended in fits of weeping, in shouts loud enough to set off the neighbor's dogs. On one occasion, he and his soon-to-be ex had fought with their fists. Barrett can still hear the table tipping over the sound of the pepper mill made as it rolled lopsidedly across the floorboards. On another, a shouting match on Barrow Street, <clears throat> bottle shattered. The words falling in love still suggest to Barrett green glass shards on a sidewalk under a street lamp. <coughs> and the voice of an old woman, neither shrill nor scolding, emanating from some low dark window, saying simply, 
don't you boys understand? People live here. People are trying to sleep. As Barrett moved into his mid and then late 30s, though, the partings increasingly tended to resemble business negotiations. They were not devoid of sorrow and accusation, but they had, without question, become less hysterical. They'd come to resemble deals and investments that had unfortunately gone wrong, despite early promises of solid returns. <laughs> <laughs> this last parting, however, was his first to be conveyed by text, the farewell appearing uninvited, unanticipated, on a screen no bigger than a bar of hotel soap. <laughs> Hi, Barrett. I guess you know what this is about. Hey, you're a bit shocked, right? <laughs> Barrett did not, in fact, know what this was about. <laughs> he got the message, of course, love and whatever future love implied had been canceled. But I guess you know what this is about. That had been something like a dermatologist saying offhandedly after your annual check around, I just know that beauty mark on your cheek, that little chocolate colored, colored speck that's been referred to more than once as an aspect of your general wellness. Who was it? Who said Marie Antoinette's pencil on her and precisely that spot is having skin cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Bear responded initially in kind by text. An email seemed elderly. <laughs> so he tapped out on tiny keys. Wow, this is sudden. I have a taco bowl. I'm where I always am. By the end of the second day, Barrett had left two more texts, followed by two voicemails, and had spent most of the second night, not even the third. By the end of day number three, he had not only received no reply of any kind, but had also begun to realize there would be no reply at all. That the sturdily built, earnest Canadian PhD candidate, Psychology in Columbia, with whom he'd shared five months of sex and food and private jokes. The man who'd said, <clears throat> yeah, I might actually love you, after Bear beside Frank O'Hare's Ave Maria, while they were taking a bath together. <laughs> the one who'd known the names of the trees when they spent that weekend in the Adirondacks was simply moving on. The Barrett had been left standing on the platform, wondering how exactly he seemed to have missed his train. <laughs> I wish you happiness and luck in the future. <laughs> on the fourth night, Barrett was walking across Central Park, headed home after a dental exam which struck him on one hand as depressingly commonplace, on the other as a demonstration of his support. Go ahead, rid yourself of me in five uninformative and woundingly anonymous lines. Sorry, I just showed on my job, but I don't know what I know about my best. I'm not going to neglect my teeth for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be pleased, pleased and thankful to know that I don't need a root canal after all. <laughs> Still, the idea that without having been offered any time to prepare for it, I never witnessed the pure, careless loveliness of this young man. It was so much like those light, innocent young athletes adoringly painted by Thomas Eakins. <clears throat> the idea that Barrow would never again watch the boy peel his briefs off before bed, never witness his lavish, innocent delight in small satisfactions, a Leonard Cohen mixtape Barrow had made for him called Why Don't You Just Kill Yourself? <laughs> for the Rangers, it seemed literally impossible, a violation of love physics. On the night of the, apparition, of the apparition, Barrett, having been relieved of the threatened root canal, having promised it false more faithfully, <clears throat> crossed the Great Lawn and was nearing the floodlit glacial mass of the Metropolitan Museum. He was crunching over ice-coated snow, <clears throat> taking a shortcut to the number six train, dripped on by tree branches. Glad at least 
be going home to Tyler and Beth. Glad to have someone waiting for him. He felt numb, as if his whole being had been injected with Novocaine. He wondered if he was becoming, at the age of 38, less a figure of tragic ardency, love's holy fool, and more a middle manager who wrote off one deal. I mean, yes, there have been some losses to the company portfolio, but nothing catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> Going on to the next, <laughs> with renewed, if slightly more reasonable, aspirations. He no longer felt inclined to stage a counterattack, to leave hourly voicemails or stand sentry outside his ex's building, but ten years ago, that's exactly what he'd done. Mm. He had done. He was a soldier of love. Now he could only picture himself as aging and destitute. If he summoned up a show of anger, it would merely be meant to disguise the fact that he was broke. He was broken. He didn't really have anything to spare. Barrett hung his head as he walked through the park, not from shame, but weariness, as if his head had become too heavy to hold upright. He looked down at the modest blue-gray puddle of his own shadow cast by the lampposts onto the snow. He watched his shadow glide over a pine cone, a vaguely runic scattering of pine needles, and the wrapper of an Ohindi bar, his tummy Ohindi bars, that <laughs> rattled by, rapidly silver, windblown. The miniature groundscape at his feet struck him rather suddenly as too wintry and prosaic to bear. He lifted his heavy head and looked up. aqua white, translucent, a swatch of veil, the star high, no, higher, lower than the star, but high, higher than a spaceship hovering above the treetops. It may or may not have been slowly unfurling, densest at its center, <clears throat> trailing off at its edges into lacy spurs and spirals. But I thought that it must be a freakish, southerly appearance of the aurora borealis not exactly a common sight over Central Park, but as he stood, a pedestrian coat and scarf, saddened and disappointed, but still regular as regular, standing on a stretch of lamp-lit ice. As he stood looking up at the light, as he thought it was probably all over the news, in his uncertainty, his immobility, standing stolid in timberlands, came to him. He knew that as surely as he was looking up at the light, the light was looking back down at him. Now, not looking, apprehending, as he imagined a whale might apprehend a swimmer, with a grave and regal and utterly unfrightened curiosity. He felt the light's intention, a tingle that ran through him, a minute electrical <coughs> buzz a mild and pleasing voltage that permeated him, warmed him, seemed perhaps ever so slightly to illuminate him, so that he was brighter than he'd been, just a shade or so or two, <clears throat> pinkly, humanly, nothing of swamp gas about it, just a gathering of faint blood light that rose to the surface of his skin. And then, either slowly or quickly, the light disappeared. It waned into a scattering of pale blue sparks that seemed somehow animated by the playful offspring of the placid and titanic parent. Then they too moved out, and as colors as they had been, as it was always been. All right, that's a little Barrett, um, just a little Tyler. Um, it's snowing. In Tyler and Beth's bedroom, Tyler and Beth and um, Barrett live together in Bushwick. Flecks of snow, tough little ice balls, more BB than flake, more gray than white in the early morning dimness, swirl onto the floorboards and the foot of the bed. Tyler awakens from a dream which dissolves almost entirely, leaving only a sensation of queasy and peevish. 
When he opens his eyes, it seems for a moment that the skeins of snow blowing around the room are part of his dream, a manifestation of icy and divine mercy. No, but it is, in fact, real snow blowing in through the window he and Beth left open last night. Beth sleeps curled into the circle of Tyler's arm. He gently disengages himself, gets up to close the window. He walks barefoot across the snow-sparked floor, doing what needs to be done. It's satisfying. He's the sensible one. In Beth, he has finally found someone more romantically impractical than he. Beth, if she woke, would in all likelihood ask him to leave the window open. She'd like the idea of their cramped, crowded little bedroom with a wife-sized snow globe. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler shuts the window with effort. <clears throat> As the miniature flurry <clears throat> As the miniature flurry blasts over him, a cinder glow, oh, hang on a second. Um, Tyler shuts the window with effort. Um, <clears throat> he stands with one eye clear and one leery and watering, watching the snowflakes hurl themselves against the glass. It's barely six o'clock. Light outside everywhere. The elderly snow piles that have been day after day plowed to the edges of the <clears throat> next door parking lot that have solidified into <coughs> miniature gray mountains, touched toxically here and there with spangles of soot, are now, for now, alpine, like something out of a Christmas card. Or rather, something out of a Christmas card if you focus tightly, edit out the cocoa-colored concrete facade of the empty warehouse, upon which the ghost of the word concrete is still emblazoned. Although grown so faint, it's as if the building itself, so long neglected, still insists on announcing its own name. And the still slumbering street with a neon cue and the liquor sign winks and buzzes like a distress flare. Even in this tawdry cityscape, though, this haunted, half-empty neighborhood, <clears throat> where the burned carcass of an old Buick has remained, strangely pious in its rusted, gutted <clears throat> and, gra and graffiti absolute uselessness. For the last year, on the street beneath Tyler's window, there's a gaunt beauty summoned by the pre-dawn light, a sense of compromised but still living hope, even in Bushwick. Here's a fall of new snow, serious snow, immaculate with its hint of a benediction as if some company that delivers hush and accord to the better neighborhoods had gotten the wrong address. <laughs> <laughs> if you live in certain places, in a certain way, you better learn to praise the small felicities. <laughs> and living as Tyler does in this place, in this placidly impoverished neighborhood of elderly aluminum siding of warehouses, parking lots, all utilitarian, all built on a cheap, with its just barely managing little businesses and its daunted denizens, Dominicans mostly, people who went to considerable effort to get here, who had, must have had higher hopes than those that Bushwick has granted them, trudging dutifully along to or from minimum wage jobs, as if defeat could no longer be defeated, as if one were lucky to have anything at all. It isn't even particularly dangerous anymore. There is, of course, the occasional robbery, but it seems for the most part that even the criminals have lost their ambition. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler should go back to bed. <clears throat> Another interlude of sleep, and who knows? He might wake into a world of more advanced, resolute cleanliness. A world wearing a still heavier white blanket over its bedrock of drudgery and ash. He's reluctant, though, to leave the window in this condition of slodgy wistfulness. Going back to bed now would be too much like seeing a delicately emotional stage play that comes to neither a tragic nor a happy ending. It means to <coughs> out, so there are no more actors on stage. 
until the audience realizes the play might be over. I have to get up and leave the theater. Now, Tyler has promised he'll cut down. He's been good about it for the past couple of days. But now, now right now it's a minor metaphysical emergency. <laughs> <clears throat> Beth isn't worse, but she isn't better. Knickerbocker Avenue is waiting patiently through its brief interlude of accidental beauty until it can return to the slush and puddle that is its natural state. All right. This morning, he'll give himself a break. He can resummon his rigor easily enough. This is only a boost of time when it is needed. He goes to the nightstand takes his vial from the drawer, and sucks up a couple of coins. Here it is. Here's the sting of livingness. He's back after his nightly voyage of sleep, all clarity and purpose. He's renewed his citizenship in the world of people who strive and connect, people who mean business, people who burn and want, who remember everything, who are lucid. He returns to the window. <clears throat> Here's Knickerbocker Avenue again. And yes, it will soon return to its ongoing condition of anywhere. -ness. It's not as if <clears throat> Tyler has forgotten that. But the grimy, impending future doesn't matter. And very much the way Beth says that morphine doesn't eradicate the pain, but puts it aside, renders it unimportant to shy so sideshow curiosity, mortifying, you know, see the snake boy, see the <coughs> lady, but remote, of course, and of course, folks <coughs> to spirit and latex. <coughs> you know, own lesser pain, the dampness of his inner workings, all those wires that hiss and spark in his brain have been snapped dry. <coughs> a, moment, a moment ago, he was buzzed out and mordant, but now, quick suck of harsh magic. He's all acuity and verb. He shed his own costume and the true suit of himself fits perfectly. Tyler is a one-man audience standing naked at a window at the start of the 21st century with hope clattering in his ribcage. It seems possible and all the surprises, he didn't exactly plan on being an unknown musician at 43, living in eroticized chastity with his dying girlfriend and his younger brother, had been part of an inscrutable effort, too immense to see. Some accumulation of lost chances and canceled plans and girls who were almost, but not quite, all of which seemed random at the time, but if window to his difficult but interesting life, his bulldogish loves, his still taut belly of the drugs to help, and <clears throat> John <laughs> Dick is home as the Republicans are about to go down in a new world, cold and clean to begin. <laughs> Tyler get a rag and wipe this melt the snow up off the floorboards. Let the care of it. He will adore Beth and bear it with more purity. He will gather and procure, take on an extra shift at the bar, praise the snow and all it touches. He will get them out of this grim apartment, sing ferociously to the heart of the world, find an agent, stitch it all together, remember <clears throat> to soak the beans for cassoulet, sing <clears throat> Get Beth to chemo on time, do less coke, and cut out the water entirely. Finally, finish reading The Scarlet and the Black. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hold Beth and Barrett, consult them, remind them how little there is to worry about. Feed them, tell them the stories that render them that much more visible to themselves. Outside, the snow shifts. It seems as if some benign force, some vast, invisible watcher, has known what Tyler wanted at the moment before he knew it himself. A sudden animation, a change, the gentle, steady snowfall taken up and turned into fiery sheets. An airy map of the wind currents and, yes, 
<coughs> Are you ready, Tyler? It's time to raise the pigeons. Five of them from the liquor store roof. Time to set them aflight, and then are you watching? Turn them silver by early light. <clears throat> Counter to the wind-blown fl flakes. Sail them effortlessly west into the agitated air that's blowing the snow toward the East River, where barges are light like ships of ice. But a moment later, it's time to turn the street lights off. Around the corner of Rock Street. Its headlights still on and its flat silver top blinking. Little green lights are in the Perfect. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs>
we just kind of uh, <laughs> there are elements, and the the, per, the the symmetries and asymmetries are endless. Mm -hmm. So really, I think it's 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 it's, it's about geometry, really. How do you, if you do, cleanse your palate between books? Do you paint? Do you travel? Do you stop talking? I mean, what do you how do I how do I cleanse my palate between books? Um, you know, I I um, I always yeah I always I, I need a few months. This is, the most, this is one of the most irritating stories I know about you know, um, um, Thackeray. <coughs> William Makepeace Thackeray wrote for five hours every day, and if during the first Three hours, he finished one novel. He spent the next two, he did subsequent two hours starting the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I am no William. Um, you know, I. It's sort of like something always comes up. Um, ranging from a phone call that resulted in this little book about Provincetown that I would never have thought to write. But somebody called me up and said we're, we're, we're publishing short books, or not exactly travel books, but books about places, by different writers. Um, I said, sure. Provincetown. There's a pause. I think at the end of the line, they were thinking more of like New York or Rome. There's no Provincetown, so better. And um, so there was that, and it sort of magically timed. And um, I, I, in the last book, this book, I, I learned Silversmith. Um, I, 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 can, I cannot overemphasize the satisfaction involved in working with metal. Because I, um, I, wanted, I, wanted I wanted to make something that, would, that mattered but didn't matter in quite the same way. It wasn't going to be critiqued for which there would be no deals. Um, so, you know, I learned to make with jewelry and bowls and things. Um, right now, I've just sold my ass to Hollywood. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a tawdry and tragic tale. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. And, and, and that, that's the sort of non-answer to an entirely legitimate question. It depends, but I always need, I need something, and I, and I, and I need the silversmithing was especially good. Because it was, it was a good reminder that there are lots of things you can make. You know? And, and that, that all, it, all, it all matters. A statement and a question. Mm -hmm. The statement is there are so many lines in your books, and when you read Mauled by Love, mm -hmm. it's such a great image. And when I, when I hit a line like that, I always stop and read it again. Mm -hmm. I get so much pleasure out of how you write, what you write. And the question is, are you willing to say anything about the screenplay you're working on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm actually doing two things. I, um, I, I just uh, I handed the treatment for, the, for a, a pilot for the TV series to show time. Um, I'm really into that. <laughs> it, 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 it's about young genius filmmakers in the early 70s. Um, and that could go, you know, TV, we don't know. Um, the screenplay, oh, we're all family, why not be candid, has been um, a little trickier. Um, it's based on a, a perfectly good novel um, set in a sort of thinly disguised marble head. You know, it's a very wealthy Atlantic coast town. Um, and the central character is a woman who's a real estate agent who's in her early, about to turn 60, and she is secretly an alcoholic. And I, I'm like, you know, I'm not right for this. It's a great story, but I'm, but not, I'm not the guy for it. And I said, well, would you feel any differently if Meryl Streep and Bob De Niro <laughs> 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 And I said, <laughs> but you know what? I was wrong. Um, 
Meryl is, is amazing. We just um, argued about the first draft in New York um, in a good way. I mean, she's fun, she's fun to play, but she's smart. Um, but bottom line, and I should, I, well, I guess I need to learn this once. If you don't feel dead passionate about something, if you don't feel like, I'm glad you called me because nobody else could do this the way I will do it. You shouldn't do it. Even if it's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one or two more, and then I should, I should have think. You yes, stop please. dead in the middle of a project and talk, <coughs> I don't have the passion for this. I don't want to do this. Yes, I better stop dead in the middle of a project and thought it. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, actually, every single time with every novel. <laughs> I can tell you a little more about that. It took me a while to figure this out. Um, I, I always find that, I'm going to, if I say around page, somewhere between page 70 or 80, I mean the point at which it has started to have a shape and an arc and it's more than just fragments, it's starting to kind of coalesce. Um, it just turns to shit on me. <laughs> I just look at it and think, what? What was I thinking about? This isn't really about anything. It's not. It, it, it's not going anywhere. I don't know who these people are. Probably wouldn't care if I did. Um, <coughs> and when I was much younger, the solution was, well, I'm going to start a new book. And this won't happen because the new book I know how to write, and and and, and I don't have to say it, right? Page, around page seventy plus, same thing. So what I realized was happening. This is not certainly universal, but I think this happens to some writers. Um, what's happening at that point was that the book was sloughing off my little idea of it and taking on an idea of itself. Because what you're trying to do is write a book that's a little bit smarter than you are. <laughs> um, which means which means finding some sort of nexus between con the conscious and the unconscious. You need both. Um, and you hope, I think, to end up with a book that isn't the book you thought you were going to write. Yeah. And that, for me, is the point of transition. And it always freaks me out. Mm -hmm. To the point where, really, every time I think, I know it turned out okay the other time, but this time, really, 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 it's, it's, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned to stay with it. And, and there's usually a few terrible weeks when I just go and turn on the computer and think, yeah, right, it's still bad. Um, but I sit there and I look, think about it. And eventually, 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 I kind of start to we inhabit it. And then it doesn't get easy, but it never again seems. Yeah, please. First, I want to thank you for your vivid reading. It was well, thank great. you. And uh, I have no questions to ask you, but I have to tell you something important for me. Um, the first time I came here five years ago, I fell in love with that place and I felt at home. So ever since, like a couple months in the summer, or just a couple weeks in the fall, I'm trying to be back. Anyways, this year I participated in a European project and we were supposed to build a museum in a very small village in Sicily. So I was supposed to live there for a year. And in the middle of the project, when everything was going very bad, I was wondering if to stay there or to quit and come here. One day I was wandering through the library, which is like three times smaller than this one, and I saw a book that was named La dove la tela finisce una passeggiata di province town. In English means there when the land ends, a walk to province town. And I think that in English that's called serendipity, and I just wanted to have Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't talk to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.